Good day to you, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm, Oxford, Ohio. We are running grass-fed Red Devon cattle, St. Croix sheep and chickens in a rotational grazing system. You can find us at birchfieldfarms.com. I have a good word for you today. This comes from Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Okay, drought monitor coming out this morning, uh, releasing data from, uh, it would have been as of Tuesday, we're in a D1 moderate drought here. Take a look at this map. Uh, this is nothing though compared to southeastern Ohio. Wow, our hearts go out to you, our, our hearts go out to you folks there. Um, shoo, look at the deep red on this map. Uh, nothing to play around with there. Uh, you gotta have a plan for drought, especially uh, when you're grass fed. Uh, pasture based um, you know we uh, talk about uh, the, the compounding effects here of our rotational grazing re regenerative system and we'll go over that again the interesting thing about our our farm here is we have ground that we rent to a local cattle farmer that's grazed that's set stock grazed so lots of selective grazing and then we have our system here that's rotationally grazed and uh, pretty interesting to look at the differences now uh, actually I actually want to do that now I'm going to show you uh, something real quick here uh, before we go out and do a sheep and cattle move and then also today I want to talk mainly about the difference between spring and fall grazing because there's a key here uh, a key here and if you can understand this uh, I believe it can really help us in successfully uh, setting up uh, a rotational uh, grazing system and there's a general principle here that I believe we can apply and we'll get to that but I want to show you something here between these two uh, grazing systems first. Okay, so we're out here. We got our, our rams over here in this section, just grazing this down. Uh, look, look at this sorghum. You guys have been around. We've grazed this sorghum uh, three times, sorghum Sudan grass, and uh, <laughs> we could graze that for a fourth here. Mama, mama does not want to do that. She that was originally kind of a cover crop mix there. She wants to let that go uh, so we don't uh, dry out that soil, which I don't think is a bad idea. But we could graze that for a fourth time. Can you believe that? Absolutely incredible. Rams are here, <clears throat> right on the other side of this fence. This area is set stock grazed, and you can see the, the weed pressure um, just, just looking right down the line here. Uh, so we do, I, I will occasionally mow this, but here's what I wanted to show you. There's a gate here. You can open this gate. Look at this. You can literally look right down the fence where, where this gate, I mean, <laughs> look at that. Look at the look at the line there in the grass. And so what what occurred to me though, what was really fascinating, and you can see uh, there's the the set stock grazed cattle there in the in the shade. So again, they're given access to to this part of the pasture back that way as well. Constant access to this. You can see the cattle paths, see the weeds, and uh, he he's out of grass out here. I mean, he's just plumb out. Uh, but it's not it's not just that. What I wanted to highlight is when when we moved our cattle over a few days ago. We came right through here and I took one of these nets and I had to string it out over to here because I don't I don't like our our especially our bulls mixing. I try and keep them separate. Try tries the keyword. Um, but I had this fence, I had to stick the fence in from this corner of the barn and come down through here and I went all the way over to that fence to run our cattle through here. And you would not believe the difference in sticking in these posts. You know, these are just step in posts. But uh, you can see how, you know, how easy that goes in there. Um, but when I got out here, I could barely get those things in the ground. I mean, this ground is rock hard out here. You got these cattle paths, you know, a lot of people don't realize there's compaction going on there. Cattle will always take the same path, always, if you leave them in the same area. And this path is going up to the automatic water there. But uh, this, is how, <clears throat> this is how they're getting by here. You know, I got the grain grain feeders putting out the grain to the, the cattle. But look at the weeds. Look at the weed pressure. And uh, again, you guys have heard me say this is not a knock. This is nothing personal. It's not a knock on on uh, the, the farmer that's here or anything like that. This is just I'm highlighting the, the difference in two different systems here. 
that's the important thing I want you to understand. Um, if you can put the time and the effort into rotating and do that correctly, uh, you know, it's just, it's my belief there is great advantage there all the way around. You know, as we talk about these two different systems too, one important thing to understand, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of associate uh, overgrazing or, um, uh, you know, just uh, uh, doing things that are not good for the land, but with, with too many animals. And that can be a part, that can, that, can, that can play a part, but understand that overgrazing is not a function of how many animals, it's a function of time. And so, you know, you can, you can overgraze with, with one cow, uh, you can overgraze with one sheep, you know, just, just leave it in the same large area for a, a long time period, and they will eat everything down uh, to nothing. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's not necessarily about how many animals, uh, it's about the amount of time uh, that the animals are left there. And so when you leave animals in an area, when they first come in, they're gonna eat what they want. They're gonna, so that's called selectively grazing. They're gonna take all that <clears throat> and, and eat it all the way down. And then if you continue to leave them there, they'll continue to, to eat stuff down. But, but uh, a lot of times too, they won't touch other stuff and so you get this selective graze and eventually you get a lot of weed pressure uh, growing up and then you get eventually if you continue to do that over and over and over then you get um, the the succession in that system it moves more towards a weedy uh, type of, of really undesirable uh, a pasture that's filled with undesirables basically and so getting getting down and understanding the amount of time that were in a certain area, I think that is key uh, to being successful uh, with your grazing systems. So on the set stock graze system uh, that's out uh, in the pasture there, you know, that farmer is running uh, about, you know, maybe 2,000 pounds of live weight animal an acre. Uh, on our system here, our rotational grazing system, we're running between 40 to 50,000 pounds per acre. I've got about 10,000 pounds of live weight animal out here in their quarter acre paddocks. So, you know, we have about 20, 20 times, uh, you know, the amount of live weight animal per acre out here. Uh, and here's the amazing thing. Uh, look at this, look at this paddock here. Uh, this is this is paddock three. This is what we're gonna move on to. Again, we got that cover crop in there. We'll take a look, but here's, here's paddock four. I mean, you know, Look at this stuff. I mean, this is in the middle of, of D1 drought here. What have we discovered in this system? Again, uh, letting the ground rest, we've talked about this, but, but, but letting the ground rest, having adequate rest time. Now, the tough thing is I get people here on the channel that, you know, somebody from Zimbabwe, right, wants to know, well, how many, you know, zebra can I graze or, or whatever? You know, I have no idea. I have no idea about even a, a couple of states over, you know, what you can, what you can do, what you can run. And so, uh, but one thing that I do know, and here's a key in setting up your rotational grazing systems is in the fall, in the fall, you will need roughly twice the amount of rest time as you will need in the spring. Uh, that's one thing we have discovered. That's also consistent with Andre Voison's writing uh, in the book, Grass Productivity. Again, looking at that sigmoid curve of grass, right? We're, we're grazing somewhere in that teenage stage. You know, there's kind of three phases, the infant stage, the teenage, and then the elderly stage where you're putting on the seed head. And try to stay at the top of that teenage uh, stage there. And I know there's a lot of folks out there that are, that are I hear about, the, you know, taking everything to the ground and, and this and that. And that's all well and good. You're just gonna need more rest, you know, if you do that. And so I think where you get into trouble is, is doing that kind of approach when you're heading into drought. We're in D1 and looking at the 10 day forecast, there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing on the forecast. And so, you know, we're in for it. We're in for it. And, uh, you know, another interesting thing is in a, a drought like this, because we have not taken everything, okay, we have retained more moisture in the soil. Okay, so what does that do? Well, when we graze down, we may be able to come back. We may get a quicker recovery here uh, versus, you know, if I would have taken everything down. Now, can you, I mean, you can do that. You can take everything. Uh, again, uh, it's just gonna be a longer rest. 
a longer recovery. And so in the spring here, we were rotating. Uh, we were coming back every 16 to 18 days starting out. Now in the fall here, this has had 36 days of rest. Okay, this paddock three. And so we'll go in here and take a look. We'll get these guys moved. But you know, 36 days of rest, that's roughly twice what we were doing in the spring. Now what about, so, so in the spring, I mean, you know, May, typically April and May, and in the fall here, uh, as defined here, I would say, you know, August and September. Those are kind of your two uh, parameters there. And then in between, you know, you, you, you kind of flex in between so based on what you're getting precipitation wise, what's working. Um, so again, you know, I'm not telling you that those are your numbers for your location because, um, you know, set stock grazing rates here are about one cow per acre is what they recommend. They being the extension office, if you're just going to turn animals out, like a farmer's doing over here, about 1,000 pound cow, one animal unit per acre, right, is what they recommend out here. Now, I know you go out west in Wyoming and it may be acres per cow. Uh, you know, the ground out there is just not as good uh, to support this kind of, of forage growth. And so you need to check with an extension office and see what do they recommend for, for your area. And then whatever you find that works in the spring, double that rest period for the fall. And when you design your paddocks, design for the fall. So if you want 30 days of, of rest, um, you know, then design, design your paddocks uh, such that you can get that uh, in in the fall, okay? And then you know, and then everything else, you know, in the spring, you'll just be, be doing much better. You could take some cuttings, you could cut some stuff in the spring, make some haylage or silage, uh, which by the way, I've, I'm getting you guys' messages on how we make that stuff. We'll do a video on that uh, at some point. Um, but uh, basically putting, putting clippings uh, in an airtight container. You don't need all the hay. Hay is great, okay, but it takes tons of resources and equipment and materials. You don't need need all that. You can do silage, haylage, pack it in an airtight container, just mow it, collect it, and then it will ferment after 30 days. Makes a very high quality feed. Uh, just We just do that with our, actually our yard grass. And it's a great supplement uh, to our hay in the winter time. So let's get in here, uh, take a look at this, uh, and then get these guys on the move. Okay, so I am, I am just tickled pink. Uh, at this uh, this stand in here. Look at all this sorghum, this cover crop that's come on. Look at the sunflowers. <laughs> look at uh, look at all the pollinators on there already. Already this morning. And uh, I mean, to have a stand like this uh, in the middle of D1 drought, um, man, that's just, as a grazer, wow, that just makes me feel so good. Look at that. Some beans there, uh, brassicas, uh, red clover, chicory, um, just a little bit of everything out here. And, uh, man, I'll tell you what, these animals are absolutely going to love this. Okay. Come on guys. Come on, moose. Come on, sheeps. Fly pressure isn't too, too bad. Got a few on the bull there. Could be worse. Come on guys. Man, they're gonna love this. What a great feeling. Come on. So we've got uh, our, our eight, eight head of Red Devon out here now. We did do uh, some, some weaning with uh, Hank. Come on, sheeps. And then our 20, I believe there's 27 ewes out here with these eight Devin. Now let's talk about, is there enough here for them, right? What, what do they need? Uh, well, you know, we, we like to figure about 3% of body weight, 3% of live weight. Uh, they're going to need that in dry matter every day. And so how could we back into, you know, how long can we stay here? So 3% of 10,000, I need about 300 pounds of dry matter a day. Now we know, I would say this is a pretty thick, pretty thick stand here. So I'm gonna use 300 pounds, 300 pounds of dry matter forage per inch of growth per acre. So we're doing quarter acre paddocks here. And so we know that, you know, if we've got a, if we've got a one foot, 12 inches of growth here, which I would say, you know, pro we're probably at that on average, 
then uh, we know we're gonna have about 900 pounds of dry matter forage in this quarter acre. So I could stay here about three days. I don't think I'll do that right now with being in D1 drought and uh, just looking ahead at that 10 day, you know, I think I wanna, I, I know I wanna leave uh, a little something covering the, the soil here to keep that moisture in because that's gonna give me a shot to get back on this and keep this rodeo going. You know, I, I don't wanna take it all the way down because then you got the, the, the rock hard brick soil underneath now we've got areas that are a little thinner here you can see right in here there was a there was a tree here at one point in time and i know the roots are still kind of under here um and so you know you, you got sections like that but i would say on average we're probably averaging out somewhere around uh 12 inches tall and uh man look at them get look at the sheep getting into that sorghum just loving it man that's so cool to have to have that for them uh, right now, when everybody else is just plumb, plumb out of grass, uh, so cool. So, I mean, what would the alternative be? Well, we'd be feeding hay right now, you know, if we, if we were out being all grass fed, I can't just throw grain, uh, at my animals. Um, not attacking you guys to do that. Okay. Don't take it that way. Uh, it's just, we choose not to do that. Ruminant animals, I, I believe are, are meant they have the, the stomach to convert grass into high quality protein for us, and that's what we do. I find that we have some really, really healthy stock uh, just doing the grass fed thing and, and just really drawn to the, the minimal inputs. I think think with the times that we're in and the times that we're coming into here, uh, we gotta learn to do, do more uh, with what we've got. And uh, here on the farm, uh, you know, grass is what we've got here. And so we're uh, trying to use that to the best of our abilities here. Let's go check these cows out. Just love it. Look at this. Look at this chicory, sorghum, red clover. She is just loving it. Pretty good, hey, Em? Good eating today. We'll have some good eating uh, when we go back on to, uh, or when we move tomorrow as well. Did not do the cover crops over here. Kind of wishing I would have. Again, with the sorghum, it's a double-edged sword. It's great this time of year. It does great through drought. But, uh, you know, after you start that freezing and frosting, we talked about that last time, that, that prusic acid uh, can be a, a concern and so you know we'll graze it down as much as possible before frost but I uh, didn't that's kind of one of the reasons I don't do it everywhere but uh, definitely getting a boost from it today here's the big boy what are you going after there bud So this is uh, Green Cover Seeds uh, Warm Season Grazing Mix. I think I've said that before, not affiliated, just had really good success with their uh, seed uh, and what they're doing. And uh, uh, we have had, I uh, believe we've had one graze on this already. We sowed this mid, there's a, there's a, topped, uh, a top sunflower already. <laughs> we've had one graze on this already. And again, uh, 30, 36 days rest and uh, double, double what we're doing in the spring. That's the key takeaway. Uh, and I think, I, I do think that's a principle you can apply across the board. There aren't many principles grazing wise that I can tell you if you're in Zimbabwe, you know, hey, here's what you, kind of some things to, to look for. I mean, you can, you know, dry matter and that kind of thing, you can, you can figure that's pretty uniform, the measurement on that anyway. But in terms of like how long to rest and rotate and all that, I mean, it's, it's such an art. It's such an art. And you guys know I've told the story before is the conversation with the local professor here, right, uh, at the local university. And just kind of working with him and 
picking his brain, you know, is there a model we could come up with that would spit out a, you know, a, a magic number based on precipitation, uh, the amount of sunlight. You know, that's the other thing too right now. You know, the sun, we're, we've got waning uh, sunlight, you know. The sunlight is, uh, we don't have as much daylight as we had back in summer solstice. Uh, I went back and looked, it's, we're about 14% less daylight. Now that doesn't, you know, 14% drop in daylight is not gonna account for needing twice as much rest. A lot of that I think is moisture and just we tend to dive off on moisture. But anyway, I was asking this guy, you know, could we come up with a model, computer model that would spit out exactly when I needed to move, you know, to optimize grass growth, you know, plug that sigmoid curve in uh, for grass growth. Uh, you know, it's just, it's so challenging because that curve is changing, right? As as the, the daylight hours and the moisture and precipitation tends to, to change, so does that. I mean, the, the curve, I shouldn't say the curve stays the same, but the timing changes. Um, and it's not linear. You know, nothing in nature, I shouldn't say nothing, very little uh, is, is just a... a a simple linear equation it's it's complex you know when you really get into it and anyway this guy this professor was saying basically saying it's impossible you you couldn't couldn't do that i don't know if he's right or not but i thought that was curious right this practice that we've done for thousands of years you know using grass this relationship between ruminants and grass and that that is that is still so complex yet it's so simple after after thousands of years that, that we can't we don't have an AI system that can can generate the perfect in other words the, the technology can't can't figure it out. It can drive a car, but it can't tell us when to move animals. Um that's curious to me. But I am uh, intrigued uh, right now with this with this redefinition of wealth uh, that's happening in this culture and uh you know, it's just so curious uh, uh, to me, um, you know, as we see the, the culture, the system continue to, to slip and slide uh, and decline. Um, you know, I don't think it, it doesn't take a profit right now to, to look at uh, what we're in the midst of and to have a realization that, OK, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're about to reap what's been sown here. That's that's no mystery. Uh, you know, you look at something like national debt. I mean, it's a joke. Uh, you know, uh, you can't even hardly talk about it. I don't even know what the number is. In the 30, 30 some trillion now. Um, you know, is that is that really going to be paid back? So what does that look like? You know, you start asking these questions, right? And I think it, for me, I eventually end up at a point where I'm, I, I, I redefine true wealth, right? I redefine true wealth. It, it, it becomes less about paper money, uh, this definition of wealth, and it becomes more about um, health. It becomes more about uh, freedom. Uh, it becomes more about um, healthy, healthy food and raising that and having these systems, these new systems that encourage that type of a lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's just curious right now. Uh, we're, we're coming full circle with a, a biblical redefining of wealth, right? It's, it's no longer paper but it's, it's starting to look like what it looked like thousands of years ago, um, flocks and herds, right? I mean, how is that not uh, a definition of, of, of wealth now and, and building those on, on grass and, and minimal inputs? I'm, I'm drawn to that, but I, I just think it's, it's so curious, uh, you know, to hear some of the conversations and the uh, whole prepping movement. And I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong right now to think about preparing, um, you know, I think there are some challenges to that, uh, you know, and, and, and not going off the deep end uh, with fear-based thinking and that kind of thing. And, you know, where do you, my, my struggle has always been, where do you draw the line? You know, why not, why not just build a life as a, a preparation that's inherently built in, right? Where, where, where is my next year's feed coming from? Uh, it's coming from right here, you know, to come up from the ground. I, I just, I, I don't think there's anything more resilient uh, right now, uh, in terms of practical systems, than than a grass-based uh, minimal input uh, ag system, as we as we plan for the future. And uh, again, you know, especially if you're in the city, I don't think it's wrong to 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 uh, do some preparing and to think ahead uh, uh, somewhat. You know, obviously we know that the Lord provides for His people, and He always has and He always will. And that's the main thing uh, to remember there. But uh, you know, when it comes to to 
storage of practical things like like say meat you know is it about refrigeration or smoking meat or uh fridge or you know uh freeze drying canning you know well i think back and i think the best way to store your meat keep it alive on the hoof right that's how it's always been done learn the skills to to process uh yourself and keep it keep it alive on the hoof and use it when you need it uh that's isn't that kind of how we got into uh, farming versus hunter gathering in the first place. I don't know, some of my thoughts, uh, meanderings perhaps today, uh, but uh, I'm excited. Point is I'm excited about the grass-fed minimal input movement here. I think it's a healthy thing when we can uh, return our, our our lifestyle, center those around something as resilient uh, as number one, the Lord, but the grass, right? Center our lives on something practical like grass. It's here pretty much uh, all the time uh, during the grazing season. There are challenges, uh, but uh, it's a good life. And uh, you know, hopefully, I'm. In, you know, I want to be about encouraging that and encouraging folks out there uh, to take that step and get these systems in place for your families, for your local communities. Here's Elsa. She great looking sheep or what? That's one of my top mamas right there. Getting that, look at that sorghum, getting that sorghum. How's it tasting, sweetie? Good stuff, huh? A little energy there? Oh yeah. I get a lot of people asking now about this Electronet. Okay, what, what size do we prefer? What works the best? Now, with our rotating here, I have been running this on the front side. So I will move this today over to there to separate paddock three from paddock four and that's simply because i have the rams right on the other side of those barns there and uh, man we're playing with fire we're playing with fire on that deal there but uh this is a 9 35 12 from premier one 164 foot long it's just what i prefer over the years i've had so many of these different sizes and everything else i'll throw a graphic up here so you can get that item number but that's just what i prefer double spike you got the two spikes in the bottom. I, I'm not affiliated with Premier One. It's just something that's worked for us. The reason I prefer this is because it's only, I believe it's 35 inches high instead of 48. And let me tell you, it is perfect for lambing season. Okay, it's it's the, the spacing on it is not too tight. You get them too tight like the chicken nets, the, the nets we use for chickens over there. And it just gets so daggone heavy. And, uh, you know, you do that every day for a couple of weeks straight, and man, you end up, you end up dreading it. Um, but this thing here, it's a lot lighter because of the spacing on the netting, and then also the, the height is a little bit lower than that 48-inch uh, standard uh, sheep net. And so I, I, I did have somebody asking, and I did have one issue with this with cattle one time, and I had a heifer in here. And she was just a little bit, she's kind of, she was in that teenage stage, a little bit wily. And she did actually hop this 35 inch net. Um, again though, what I tell people, when you're designing your system, you know, if you can leave adequate rest, in other words, if you can have, if you can have forage in your paddocks, adequate forage, then fencing really kind of becomes sort of an afterthought okay and what i mean by that is the opposite of that is when they get everything eaten down like if i would have stayed on this another day here um and and i wouldn't have this i just have these two hot wires these sheep i i, I just know them I, I know their behavior they would they would go underneath that wire they'd take a shock i mean they would they would absolutely risk a shock to get over here and have something to eat and so i say all that to say it really, you know, your fencing and your, it really comes back to your system of grazing. And do you have enough there for them or are you starving them out? If there's enough there, then um, I found that, that cattle, both cattle and sheep are, are not gonna challenge fences uh, much at all. Um, that does just with our animals here. Now I've had, I've, we've done some work with Angus. I've seen, twice I've seen Angus hop gates. Uh, I had one I was loading one time, and I guess it was a, a black baldy Hereford Angus cross, and we were taking him in for meat. 
and I had, uh, it was like, like that barn door over there, see the double doors? And I had the top one open. And I was out messing with nets, and I actually had all the gates open and everything, and I heard a big crash. And uh, I looked around, this was over in the hay barn, I was loading him, we were getting ready to load him. And he had come over top of that bottom gate there, and I don't know how he didn't completely crush it, but he, he, had, he had jumped completely out over that gate. I could not believe it. And uh, man, I ran to that that gate that was to the outside there and I got to it just in time before he did. But I had that happen and then we had another, after weaning, we had uh, one of the other farmer's uh, cows uh, was in with ours up front there in the front paddock. And the uh, only way that could have happened is if she jumped a gate, went over to the gate and the whole thing hardly opens now because it's all bent up. So she come over that uh, as well. So, I, you know, I don't know. Angus seem a little rowdier than our, our Devons here. But generally speaking, I think if they have enough forage and there's just there's enough there for them to eat, there's really not there's really not an issue. I can't say that across the board with all breeds, though. But uh, with these these guys here, that's kind of the way it works. Hey guys, thanks for hanging with me uh, today on Pasture. If you need me, if you need to get in touch, if I can help you, please reach out. Uh, website's birchfieldfarms.com. There's a contact form there. You can uh, get straight to me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, reminder today that as crazy as these times get, as crazy as this world is, you were made uh, for these times. You have a purpose. Uh, and so lean into that uh, in these times and in these days. And uh, be well today. Be at peace. And we'll talk to you next time. Take care.